Okie dokie, so today we're going to be doing the lecture for the third lab that's on the beam. And yeah, so that's the plan for today, but before we do that, um, it's I got a few announcements. So the first one, the most important, your memo for the first lab that's due today. So there's four of you that I've turned it in, that turned it in so far. So there's still a lot more of you that got to turn that in. Uh, so make sure that you turn it in by 11.59 p.m. Okay. Um, so, yeah, make sure you do that. Um, also, you know, make sure before you turn it in that you looked over everything. Uh, so, you, so you're actually doing the right format and you actually um, are, you know, submitting everything that I want you to submit. So. Make sure you go to the syllabus and double check that you have everything in there. So let's see. Go here, syllabus. So if you're in the syllabus, make sure you go over the the memo structure here and that you cover everything that you see here in each of the sections. Right, and then also for the abstract, you know, make sure that you looked over the resources that I gave you. So if you go to the modules page, I got a, f yeah, I got this uh, page here for the abstract, and there's a few different uh, resources there. If the, if these resources, by the way, they should say it, but if they don't, your abstract should be around 200 words. If, if I never said that, I probably have, but in case I haven't, the abstract should be around 200 words. It shouldn't be too long, but these resources, they should say that. And so, you know, I've said a lot of these things before, but I also have this memo template, so you can take a look at that. Then it goes over, you know, what I expect to see or the kind of format. And okay, um, and obviously, you know, there's the video for the data reduction that uh, I'm sure everyone has seen by now for the first lab. And um, I don't know, over, okay, well, four, day, four days ago, I uploaded the data reduction for the second lab. So you can take a look at that. I cover everything in this video besides calculating the elastic modulus, so... Um, you should be good to go there. And I did notice that I had an error at one part. So I I had my parentheses kind of a little messed up for calculating the cross-sectional area. So that's at 1452. Um, and I show the correction here. And so I have it for MATLAB, which you know is going to be the main thing that we use in this class. But I also made one, let's see, when was that? Two days ago or something? Oh, okay, one day ago. So I made one one day ago uh, for the data reduction in, in Python. Um, so, you know, Python isn't required for this class, but, you know, really you can use any programming language that you want for the data reduction, but I want you to be, you know, using a programming language. And, you know, it's a good thing if you guys learn Python too, because it's going to be used more than a lot more than MATLAB outside of school. Um, but you know, Python here, this is totally optional. Just if anyone wants to take a look, uh, I did the data reduction for lab two in Python as well. And you'll see it's really similar in this case to um, the coding in MATLAB. Okay, so there's a question. Do I want a separate references page? Yeah, your references should be on their own page. Uh, let's go back here. So if you go to the memo template, let's open this up. Uh, did I not put it in here? Okay, I guess I don't have it on this example, but yeah, your references, um, you know, you should have a section, at least a section. It should be its own page though that says uh, references, and then you'll list all them out. And you know, in your 
memo, you should actually have your references also um, in line, so in the text. Let me go back to the syllabus. Okay, so references, you should have, again, a, a section, and also they should be cited within the body of the text. So when you have your table for like the published value of, let's say like the UTS or something, you should uh, be referencing that um, there. Okay, yeah, Samson, if you have a new section starts on a new page, I have no clue. I don't use Word um, very often at all, at all anymore. But um, yeah, it should be on, a, on its own page for the references. Okay, let's see. I got, um, oh yeah, one more thing, group names. So I don't think anyone in this class has given me any group names. So if you're in Discord, I made a little announcement in there, I don't know, before the weekend, I think that I'm kind of restructuring the Discord server. So uh, everything is going to be grouped by lab, by each lab that we have. And then kind of like a, a subgrouping is by group names. So instead of having group numbers, which they kind of change like every class, basically once we go into the lab, uh, that's too hard to keep track of. So I want you guys to come up with your own group name. So talk to your team members and then have someone tell me what your group name is and I'll make that in Discord so uh, you can talk to your group members in there. So really, you know, do that as soon as you can so I don't have to just keep waiting and no one has a group name where you guys can, or where you're not allowed to talk to your members yet. Well, obviously you can't, but I want everything to be sorted by the group name. Team Patrick, um, yeah, don't do that. Okay, so are there any questions before we get started today on the lecture? Okay. Let me share my screen. My iPad. I also remember that your uh, submission, it has to be a PDF. So again, we're going to be talking about the beam today. So, um, you know, you can check this out on VKS as well uh, to see what that looks like. Eh, you know what? Well, while I am here, let's do that. Let's pull this up. Okay, you know, we haven't been using VKS this um, semester so far just because uh, Dr. Sue has been making her own updated uh, templates. Did they take it off? Okay, here it is. It's different now. Okay, so the beam, let's just take a, a quick look at what this is actually going to look like, just so you can kind of visualize what the experiment is going to be. Uh, so we have our I beam here. So that's the type of beam that we're going to use. We got 1018 steel. And we got our friend, the uh, strain gauge on here as well. So we're going to be measuring strain along this surface here. 
and we're going to use that to uh, help calculate the bending stress. So you're going to be measuring the uh, some of these, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the geometry here with the, with the caliper, and we're going to use that later on to calculate the moment of inertia. And so this one, it, it looks like the setup. Okay, we have two supports here, and basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to apply two loads kind of in the center of the beam. So you're going to have one load here, one load here. They're going to go down on the beam, and what that is going to cause is it's going to cause, you know, the beam to bend. And we're going to be looking at one area in specific to look at the bending stress that's going to occur there. So you see we have this old school dial gauge. Uh, we have a new gauge now where it's just digital and it's like no effort for you to use. So that's nice. And this is set up here where you have this kind of nub for lack of a better word where it's in the very center of the beam. And that's where it's going to have its maximum deflection once it bends. So we're going to be looking at that bending stress there but also the vertical deflection that we have. Wish they had a better picture of the actual test setup. Uh, I don't really have any good ones. This is probably the best one here. You can only see one support. Um, but yeah, so we have a beam and we're going to have two loads that are being applied. And then towards the center section of the beam, we're going to be looking at the bending stress and vertical deflection there. All right, let's go back to our notes. Okay, so let's first uh, get a little definition for, um, I guess, maybe not really definition, but what we're doing for this experiment, okay? It's going to be uh, bending and looking at the, ver at the vertical deflection. Okay, so beams, they are going to, uh, by definition, beams are going to support a transverse load. So a load that's going kind of perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. Okay, and then that transverse load, that's going to uh, cause bending stress to occur and vertical deflection. So, you know, so far we've been having our two experiments where we were doing a tension test. So that was applying a load along the longitudinal axis. This time we're doing it perpendicular to that axis. So we'll get a very fancy drawing here. Let's get our beam. And then we're going to draw out the supports that we have. Um, actually, I think they're both roller supports in the lab. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm going to do a pin. Okay, we got a pin and a roller. Okay, and um, if you look at the lab handout, which I haven't uploaded yet, I don't think. Uh, basically, we have this this um, I-beam, which is going to be 12 inches long. And um, it's kind of broken up into three different sections. Three um, equal sections of four inches each. Okay, where well, all of them are given a, a name of A. So again, that's uh, th three sections where they're each four inches. The total beam length is 12 inches. And then we have these two loads up here. Which we're going to call P divided by 2. So um, I think the loading is, well, it's going to be changing the whole time. But I, I can't remember the maximum loading. 
off the top of my head. But just like lap two, we're going to be staying within the elastic range. Because, uh, you know, we don't want to break this beam. We have a strain gauge on there, uh, number one, which costs a lot of money. And then the beam itself, um, it's a lot more substantial than just the rods we've been testing. Uh, so we're going to stay within the elastic range for this lab as well. But, um, you know, there is going to be bending going on. I don't think it's too apparent, uh, you know, looking just by your eye. You can't see it uh, bent too, too much, but uh, I think you should be able to, s to see it at least a little bit. Okay, and what we're going to be doing, you know, once we have these two loads here, we're going to be looking at that very middle section, uh, because in that middle section, we're going to have constant bending. So if we were going to draw like a, um, a shear moment diagram or shear and moment diagram, um, basically what you would see in the middle, let's use black. You know, we're not going to go over the actual theoretical calculations of the shear moment diagram. I'll leave that to your, your class. But if we're looking at the moment, okay, that's all I'm going to draw here. Okay, so in the very center there, you're going to have um, a constant um, moment, and there's going to be no shear force there. So in this region, that's where we have this constant bending force. I guess I should have said constant bending moment. And that's where we're going to, again, look at our bending stress and then the vertical deflection that occurs there. Okay, so um, once we have our beam, right, we got our, got our beam here and we uh, have our load, we're going to be looking at that place in the center. And once we have this bending that's occurring, on the very top surface here, we're going to be in compression. And then on the bottom surface, we're going to be in tension. Um, you know, it's not a very thick beam there, but uh, you can just roll along with it. So we're going to talk about uh, the neutral surface, which is going to be related to that compression and that tension I just talked about. Alright, so let's think about that center part or that middle part that we just talked about up here. Let's consider that that's going to be in pure bending. So just imagine that this is that section here. Once we apply the, the load and um, once we apply that load, we're going to undergo bending stress and vertical deflection. Oh, it's pretty terrible. Oh well. Let's roll with it. And so what we're going to have on our top surface, we're going to be in compression. And then on the bottom surface, we're going to be in tension. So in your actual solid mechanics class, what uh, the instructors often talk about is kind of imagine that in the beginning here that these are like a stack of longitudinal fibers so right now in the beginning they're all the same length but once we um, apply tension the the fibers on top they're going to undergo compression and then the fibers on the bottom they're going to undergo tension
guess I'll put that in quotes because of course you know we have uh, 1018 steel we don't really have fibers that would be more something like with wood that would be a better analogy but we're going to say that these fibers on top they are going to undergo compression and they're going to get uh, shortened Okay, and then the fibers on the bottom, they're going to elongate under tension. Okay, so we have this gradient, um, you know, either way you want to look at it. We're going from tension to compression or from compression to tension. So within that gradient, there's going to be some point where we're neither in compression or in tension. Uh, another way to think about it is those fibers, they're not going to get shortened or elongate. They're going to stay at the, the same length the entire time. So they're going to experience neither compression or tension. Um, they're just going to be chilling out the whole time during the test. And that plane, or really it's a surface, right, in 3D, um, so that surface is called the neutral surface. So between this compression to tension gradient, There exists a neutral surface. Okay, and then again, that's going to be neither in compression or in tension. And this neutral surface is going to be important um, for our calculations later on once we want to calculate the bending stress. My, I hate having my notes on my laptop, not this computer. I gotta keep looking over. Um, so, um, there's a very important thing here. Um, and there, there's a lot of math for the derivation for this, which we're not going to be going over. I'll keep that or I'll leave that to your solid mechanics class. But really, there would be like a few pages of math probably. Um, but there's going to be this, after all of this math, there's a very important result that we come to, which is in, a, in this kind of area of pure bending, which is what we're looking at for our experiment, uh, the neutral axis is going to pass through the centroid of the cross-sectional area. And we can calculate the centroid. We have a symmetric I-beam. So that's going to be directly in the in the center, basically, of our I-beam. Um, really, it's going to be, you know, just the height divided by 2. OK. And that's going to be really handy for us, then, with, um, with uh, our calculations later on for the bending stress.
Okay, so, you know, if we didn't have this symmetric I-beam, um, then this wouldn't be true. So, um, you know, we want to know the, or we could calculate the centroid actually, um, but it would be a little bit harder, you know, because it's a symmetric I-beam, it's very easy to, to find that centroid. It's going to be just in the middle of the, the beam. Um, so that, that makes it a lot easier for us to then um, to then calculate the, the bending stress because we know where that neutral surface is. Um, so, you know, if we, if we didn't have this case, it's a lot harder to find the neutral surface. Um, I mean, this has been years ago now since I took the solid mechanics class, but you should have a a lecture on the uh, the neutral surface and, and how to find that. So again, you know, for us, it's very easy. We know where the neutral surface is. It's uh, for this area of pure bending, it's going to pass right through the centroid of the cross-sectional area, which we know. So now let's get to the, the actual equations. Okay, so the, the general equation for bending stress is going to be sigma B, and that'll be equal to M, which is the moment, multiplied by Y, that's going to be the distance from the neutral surface, and then divided by I, the moment of inertia. So let's write all of those out. Okay, so we know everything in this formula. Um, we're going to write them all out later and kind of simplify it. But we're going to be able to find the moment, which is going to be our load multiplied by A. Remember, A was uh, these three different sections that we have. And then we're going to divide that by 2. Um, you can go through that derivation if you want. Uh, that kind of comes from our shear moment diagram up top. And then, I don't think anyone's going to want to do that, but you can. And then why that's the distance from the neutral surface. Remember, the neutral surface, for us, it passes through the centroid. So y, that's just going to be the height of the I-beam divided by 2. Because remember, the, the centroid is right in the middle. And then I, the moment of inertia, we can calculate that. We're going to do that at the very end of the lecture. Uh, we have a rectangle. Basically, you know, we have an I-beam, so you can think of that as kind of three different rectangles. So we just need to calculate the moment of inertia for all three rectangles. And then we can um, find the moment of inertia. So we'll go over that at the, at the end, though. Because right now that might sound a bit weird. All right, so let's talk about, you know, that's the basic formula. So in our experiment, we're going to have, we're going to calculate the theoretical maximum bending stress that we're going to have. And we're also going to calculate the theoretical vertical deflection. And then once we're actually in the lab, you know, we're going to experimentally find that maximum bending stress and vertical deflection. And then we're going to compare all of those values. Okay, so this maximum bending stress, um, you know, if you think about it, it's it's pretty intuitive, but it's either going to occur on the top of our beam here or in the bottom. Because uh, remember, you know, in the, in the very center here, we have this neutral surface where it's neither in compression or in, or in tension. So there's basically um, 
you can kind of think of it that there's no stress, there's no bending stress in this very center region. So as we continue to go away from that center region or that neutral surface, then the bending stress must increase. So that's either going to be on the top or the bottom, theoretically, and that'll um, you know depend on the distance from the, the neutral surface. But for us, theoretically, that neutral surface is directly in the middle uh, section of our beam. So the top and the bottom surface, again, theoretically, they should have the same bending stress. You know, in reality, we don't have a perfectly symmetric I-beam, so it's going to be different. Uh, but theoretically, they're the same, right? And so we just have a strain gauge on one surface. I and I can't remember if it's on the top or the bottom. I think it's going to be on the top because on the bottom, that's where we're measuring that vertical deflection. So let's write all of that out. Alright, so you know, that might be a good source of discussion, by the way, just to throw it out there for your memo for this lab. You know, theoretically, they're both, both surfaces, you know, the top and the bottom, are an equal distance away from our neutral surface, but in reality, this isn't a symmetric I-beam as much as, you know, the machinist might try to make it a symmetric I-beam. It's not going to be, so theoretically, um, either the top or the bottom is going to have a higher maximum bending stress, but we are only measuring the bending stress on one of those surfaces experimentally um, because we only have the strain gauge on one of those. <laughs> okay, so let's write out the uh, maximum theoretical bending stress. Okay, So it's just going to be... Um, you know, this formula that we already uh, derived in quotes, but we're actually going to simplify it a bit now. Okay, so I'm calling this sigma b theo for theoretical. Okay, we have m times y divided by i, which we already wrote out, but now we're actually going to, you know, uh, specify what m is, what y is, and i we're going to calculate uh, later on. Okay, so m is our moment. And that's going to be p multiplied by a divided by 2. Remember a is our length right there. So we're looking at the moment in this entire region here. And A, you know what, let's write this out to you. It's, it's on your handout, but A, remember, is four inches. I should double check that. Uh, it's four inches though. 
Okay, and then y is, remember, the distance from the neutral surface. So that's going to be the height of the I-beam divided by 2. Let's go back to our beam here. So we have the height. And in the middle, we have our neutral surface. So, you know, what is that? What's the distance from the neutral surface? It's just the height divided by 2. And then uh, again, I, the moment of inertia, we'll talk about that in a bit. So basically, you know, in MATLAB, what you can do is you can define a variable for all of these, okay? And so you have a line where you have M equals P multiplied by A divided by 2, another line for Y, H divided by 2, and then another line for the moment of inertia. And then you can have a whole new line where you just uh, calculate that theoretical bending stress. So it can be nice and clean that way. Okay, that's the maximum bending stress. Let's box all of this because that's going to be important. And now let's talk about the experimental maximum bending stress. All right, so I've been saying this whole time that we have a strain gauge that is attached to the beam, which is very important. If you think back to lab one, we had an equation. Thanks, I think it's Hooke's Law, right? So we have stress sigma equals capital E, our, um, our stiffness, okay? Our elastic modulus, <laughs> I was blanking on the word at first, multiplied by the strain. So remember, this is only valid in the elastic region. We're going to be staying within the elastic region for this test. So this will be valid for us. <laughs> okay, so this is it, right? Uh, the bending stress, let's put a little B here. And EXP, so we know we're talking about the experimental bending stress. That's equal to our elastic modulus multiplied by the strain. So the elastic modulus, uh, you can just use the published value this time. And again, that's for 1018 steel. That'll be on the handout as well. And it's on the procedures too. And then our strain, that's going to be from our strain gauge. So we're given that directly. And um, just like lab two, it's given in units of micro strain. So we need to do our conversion where we multiply that by 10 to the negative six. And that's all we have to do. We, you know, we, we just plug that in and we get our experimental bending stress. Um, I say experimental maximum bending stress because we're just looking at that center section um, in our beam. All right, and then our the last thing we're going to be talking about is the vertical deflection. So first thing is the theoretical maximum vertical deflection. Okay, so I'm not going to draw this out. I'll just, again, use my fancy prop. So we have our beam, yeah. We have two loads in the center here. We apply the loads, and in the, in the very center, in the very, very center of the beam, or I guess middle, whatever you want to say, we have the maximum vertical deflection there. So we're at rest. Apply the load in the very center of the beam. That's where the maximum deflection is going to occur. So, hmm, 
yes, there is derivation for this as well. We're not going to be going over that one either. In fact, I don't even have the derivation myself. Yep. Uh, so I'll just give you the formula for that. It almost looks empirical, but it's not. It's actually, there is a derivation for it. So we're going to write delta. That's a pretty crappy delta, but that's delta theo for uh, theoretical vert vertical deflection. That's equal to 23 multiplied by our load multiplied by the length cubed all over 1,296, see, it almost looks empirical, but again, it's not, multiplied by our elastic modulus and the moment of inertia. And let's box this as well. And this one. Okay, because all of these are important. So again, P, that's our load. That's going to be increasing the length, that's 12 inches. E, the elastic modulus, look at the published value for 1018 steel. I, the moment of inertia. All right, and then we have the experimental maximum vertical deflection. Style gauge, right? No calculations involved here. So our experimental uh, maximum bending stress, we still need a calculation uh, for Hooke's law, which is just the elastic modulus multiplied by the strain. But for the maximum vertical deflection, we're actually gonna measure that directly using that dowel gauge that I talked about. So on VKS, you saw the old school one, which is fine, but just kind of annoying. Uh, you guys, you, you're going to have a digital reading. Um, and all you got to do is just look down, read it, write it down. So I will say, just as a quick aside, there's been some issues with those, uh, with those vertical, I'm um, sorry, with those uh, digital dial gauges in the past. So sometimes they, they kind of like stick and it, it actually doesn't record the deflection. So if that's the case, you know, let me know and we'll try to fix it. Um, but that has been an issue in the past. So hopefully it's not anymore, but I uh, got to keep that in mind. So if you do experience an issue, let's say on one test where maybe you didn't notice that the vertical deflection wasn't changing on that dial gauge and you already ran the whole test, um, instead of doing it again, you can just talk about that in your memo for the kind of the source of error. All right, so I, I lied. This was not the last thing we need to talk about. The last thing is the moment of inertia. Okay, so I'm gonna draw a little cut of our I-beam here, a little cross section. All right, so not 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 perfect, but really that's actually kind of what it's going to be like in reality. You know, this top part here versus the bottom part. In reality, they might not be uh, the same. So, anyways, I'm gonna give you a little cross section actually in the lab, and you guys are gonna measure that. And um, another source of error, which is kind of a little annoying to be honest, but. It's how it is. So remember in lab two, you guys, you, you looked at the rod and you measured the diameter after you finished all of your tests. 
Um, and you, you didn't measure it in the very center because the strain gauge was there, and we don't want to ruin that. Well, remember that we have a strain gauge on on this as well. And even more than that, you know, um, the lab technician, he sets this up himself before the test. And we have the dial gauge under there as well. So it's just a hassle to take that off and put it back on. So instead of measuring uh, the geometry of that, you're given just a sample cross section and you measure the geometry of that instead. So, you know, we're not actually measuring the geometry of the specimen that we're testing, which is, yes, kind of ridiculous, but again, it's because it's just a big hassle to take it off and put it back on and set it up correctly. Um, so that's a really good uh, source of error right there that you're going to talk about in your experiment. <laughs> okay, so how to calculate the moment of inertia here? We're gonna basically say that we have this one big rectangle here in purple, and then we have these little rectangles in red. So we're gonna calculate the, uh, the moment of inertia for all of those. And what we're gonna do in the end is take that, that one that was in purple and then subtract the moment of inertia for those two red rectangles. Uh, moment of inertia of a rectangle is just, you know, 1 divided by 12 times the base times the height cubed. So let's write all of that out. Okay, that's the formula. This is also on the deliverables handout. Um, I know I have some variables there that I haven't defined yet. I'll do that right now. But um, what I'm gonna, what I'm about to draw is on the deliverables handout that I'll have for this as well. Okay, we got our height. That's pretty obvious. We got the base. And then here we have S, and then here we have D. Okay, so there you go. Um, and again, this method that I have here in this equation, you can see that it's the really big rectangle, and then we're subtracting these little rectangles right there. Okay, so that's that's it for the notes. I'm not done quite yet. I want to go back to Canvas. Okay, yeah, I'm just making sure that I actually uploaded the deliverables for lap two. My mouse was going slow. Okay, so just a few reminders before we finish today. Memo one due tonight, make sure you do that. So go to assignments, memo one, and it's, um, you gotta turn it in as a PDF. Okay, so you can submit it here. And I don't need your, your script um, as a separate file. You need to have the script at the very end of your memo. So you, you put the entire script in there. Um, I, I've had some questions on the data sheets. So in the, in the memo, it says, or on the syllabus, it says to have uh, for your data sheets, put in all of your raw data. Well, for this lab, that would be pretty insane. I think someone said it would be like, I don't know, like 50 pages or something. I forget exactly, but. Uh, basically, you just need a sampling of each test that you ran for the data sheet. So you could do like the first 10 rows of the first test, then the first 10 rows of the second test, the first 10 rows of the third test. And you can do it that way. Um, so it's not insane. I know that that's really not a great solution either. 
uh, but that's what we're gonna do just to save on space okay so that's due tonight memo two that's due in in one week from today so remember that the very first experiment i gave you guys three weeks to do that but that was an exception usually um, all of them are going to be due in two weeks from the date that we had the experiment so memo two that's due next week on october uh, 7th is that wrong did i put the wrong date let me check my phone really quick no okay i'm yep i can't do math in my head okay so yeah that's due next week on october 7th make sure you do that again the data reduction video i i put up on four days ago so take a look at that and yeah are there others a question oh some questions okay Okay, uh, is it fine to re-upload your memo? Yeah, so yeah, you can re-upload your memo. I'm not, I don't grade any of them until the deadline passes. So yeah, sorry, I didn't have a references section in that memo template. Um, but just kind of in general, make sure that all of you, you look at the syllabus and look at the kind of rubric that I have here. Make sure that you have every single thing in here, and that's going to ensure that you can get the maximum amount of points as possible. Also, I want to say really quick too, for the figures that you export, make sure you actually export them or save them. Um, don't take a screenshot of them. That's a, a really big pet peeve of mine. So if you take a screenshot of your plot, delete that and, and resave it. So uh, to do that, what you do is you go to file and then export in, in MATLAB and you can save it that way. Uh, that's in the video I uploaded. I know for us, uh, we went through the data reduction as a class, but I actually made a video, a separate video as well, which is basically everything that we did. But in that video at the very end, I showed how to actually export your figures and you can do that through code or through the GUI as well. So here is in code. Um, so yeah, again, just make sure you actually save your figure and you don't take a screenshot. All right, so that's it for today. So are there any questions before I let you guys go? All right, if there's no questions, then I'll see you guys next week. Remember, next week we're going to be doing experiment three in person. So we're going to meet at E22 and then head over to the lab. All right, see you guys. Have a good weekend. All right, you too. Thank you, Patrick. Mm-hmm. All right, either of you have any questions? Okie dokie. I'm going to end the meeting, all right? I'll see you guys next week.